we have a great morning in store for all of you. There's a great deal to cover, um, but I want to say a few words uh, to frame our discussion. Before I do that, uh, I, I would just like to recognize a few um, very important friends who are in the room. Uh, Carol Mason, the uh, Assistant Attorney General of, uh, for the Office of Justice Programs is here. Hi, Carol. Thanks for being here. Um, I will introduce later uh, Denise O'Donnell, who is the Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance. So Denise, we're delighted to have you here. And mom and dad, uh, nice to have you here too. Um, I'm sure you all can imagine who I am most worried about um, critiquing me after this introduction. Um, so we're here to talk about solitary confinement, its overuse, and the imperative to dramatically reduce it. Uh, the topic probably conjures many things, uh, many diverse things for people here in the audience, 80,000 or 100,000 people locked away for 23 hours a day, seven days a week, some for years on end, six by nine or eight by 10 uh, square uh, foot concrete cells with steel toilets, uh, slabs and thin pads for mattresses, people deprived of human contact. Some people here in this room may describe this as torture, a violation of human rights, or certainly of human dignity. Some might see it as a necessary evil, uh, far too much of it, perhaps, uh, certainly of course, but uh, a necessary method to control and make manageable, difficult to manage correctional institutions. It could conjure for some of you in this room images of people like Khalif Browder, who many of you may know of, the young man in New York City who committed suicide this summer uh, after spending three years in Rikers, a good portion of that in solitary confinement. Uh, he became undone after that, uh, despite having seemed to have gotten his life on track. Um, it could conjure images of uh, some of the most resilient people that we know about uh, who have suffered through years of solitary confinement and miraculously managed to thrive, Nelson Mandela or maybe even a few folks that you will meet today. Um, whatever your specific understanding is and whatever your frame of reference might be, I think you'll all admit that we're at a remarkable moment in time. Uh, and it's a moment of building consensus, as there is in so many other areas of criminal justice reform, that the punitive excesses of the past have to be reversed. So for me, as the head of the Vera Institute, uh, it is a reward to see how far we've come. One of the main points of reference that I have when I think about this work is something that we started 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, almost to the day, we launched something called the Commission on Safety and Abuse in America's Prisons. And we launched that national effort. It was co-chaired by Nicholas Katzenbach and John Gibbons uh, to examine and report on conditions of confinement uh, in America's prisons and jails. And that was very soon after the Abu Ghraib uh, uh, scandal in Iraq. And we wanted to uh, have that that effort and to use that moment to ask how are people treated in prisons and jails in our country? Um, did the behaviors that we saw in Iraq relate at all to what we see uh, in prisons and jails in the United States? And for us at Vera, this was an important conversation to have because when we look back at it, we couldn't think of a national conversation that had really occurred around this topic for 30 years. The last one that we could pinpoint was the Attica Report, which was released in 1974, written by Arthur Lyman, who too was a Vera trustee. And so uh, uh, we completed that report and we released it and the commission had something to say about solitary confinement. Uh, it talked about the need for its dramatic reduction. Uh, it talked about the need to use it only as a last resort. It talked about the need to end uh, conditions of isolation and deprivation, and it called for specific protections for the mentally ill. So yesterday, I was sitting in a meeting with a number of you who are in a, the room today, uh, a number of jurisdictions who uh, have committed to developing safe alternatives to solitary, uh, and a number of leaders who have uh, dedicated their lives' work in the past few years 
to actually reducing it. And as I listened to these representatives, um, I couldn't help but be absolutely blown away by the commitment that correctional leaders are showing around the country. And I listened to people like Rick Ramish and to Greg Markenthal, who you will hear from today, both of whom uh, shared what I would describe as their absolute conviction uh, to reduce the practice and uh, shared with us uh, very hopeful stories of their success in doing so. So it was uh, not hard for me to feel uh, intensely gratified at the progress that uh, we are making. And this brings me to my penultimate point, and that is that expectations uh, have increased dramatically and quickly this summer alone. I want you to just think about it for a second. At the beginning of the summer, Justice Anthony Kennedy uh, called attention to the practice in his concurrence in the Ayala case, inviting Eighth Amendment arguments. President Obama uh, became the first president to visit a federal prison, and he too called for a Department of Justice review of the practice. Uh, correctional leaders, many of whom are in the room today, uh, uh, and their organization called for a sharp reduction in the use of long-term solitary, and there was a settlement of the California Pelican Bay litigation. So all of this in the span of probably about uh, two months and it's just like we hit light speed. There's a scene in Star Wars where Han Solo is piloting the Millennium Falcon. And he's trying to get away from Imperial Star Destroyers. And Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi are there and they're bugging him and they're saying, what's taking so long? Uh, why are we not going into light speed? So think about it. And if you can't quite remember that scene, let's see if we can remind you. What's that flashing? We're losing a deflector shield. Both trap yourselves in. I'm going to make a jump to light speed. <laughs> so those stars shooting by, that was this summer. <laughs> and the expectations really are upon us, all of us in the room, to do something and to uh, to take advantage, I think, of the public attention that has been given this matter and the motivation and the concern that people are expressing. Star Wars, as we know, is a parable about light and darkness. And we might think a little bit about our mission in similar terms, that we're on a mission to escape the darkness of our past. Uh, as Ta Nahisi Coates, uh, those of you may not uh, know this, but he, uh, unlike any of us in this room today, I think, uh, just won a MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, so uh, kudos to him. As he wrote in The Black Family in the Age of Mass Incarceration, as African Americans begin, began filling cells in the 1970s, rehabilitation was largely abandoned in favor of retribution. The idea that prison should not reform convicts but punish them. For instance, in the 1990s, South Carolina cut back on in-prison education, banned air conditioners, jettisoned televisions, and, dis and discontinued intramural sports. Over the last 10 years, Congress has repeatedly attempted to pass a No Frills Prison Act, not over the last, but over the next 10 years after that, a No Frills Prison Act, which would have granted extra funds to state correctional systems working to prevent luxurious conditions in prison. Solitary confinement, prisons within prisons, and our overuse of it is perhaps the very epitome of this ethos. And so in this historic moment that we're in after this summer, we have to shake off our history. So I want to leave you with a, a quote from someone else, not Han Solo, not Ta-Nehisi uh, Coates, uh, but Pope Francis, who spoke on Sunday when he met with people who were incarcerated at the Curran Fromhold Correctional Facility in Philadelphia. The time in your life can only have one purpose this time, to give you a hand in getting back on the right road to give you a hand to help you rejoin society. All of us are part of that effort. All of us are invited to encourage, help, and, and enable your rehabilitation. 
a rehabilitation that seeks and desires inmates and their families, correctional authorities, social and education programs, a rehabil rehabilitation which benefits and elevates the morale of the entire community. And so with that, we ask ourselves today whether current practices with solitary confinement provide for public safety, whether they rehabilitate, and perhaps most importantly, whether they are the kinds of practices that benefit and elevate the morale of society.